In the middle of the Hebrew Bible, we find a collection of 150 poems. I find this astonishing. I mean, it took like 60 years of being around the Psalms to realize that there was a, I repeat myself, a collection of poems at the center of the Hebrew Bible. And in fact, a collection of poems so important to the writers of the New Testament that they cite the Psalter more than any other book from the Hebrew Bible. Psalms, Talim, songs, a playlist <laughs> that for millennia has given Jews and Christians a great deal to sing about. And about all sorts of subjects, the Jerusalem temple, the Davidic monarchy, the joy of Torah, human wisdom, human folly, revenge, but more than anything else, these songs are about both the presence of God and God's absence. About what it feels like to be a believer. And not only when your cup runneth over with thanksgiving, but when you feel yourself dried up like a potsherd, tossed into a pit, given up for dead. The emotional range of the Psalter is extraordinary. So too, the power of the subjective I. I know the I of the Psalms is also Israel and we. But it's the I that we hear. An I who is exuberant, dramatic, very mood swingy, impatient, joyful, enraged, never nice. Oh, what a relief as a Christian to read the Psalms and realize that they're never nice. <laughs> they give us license to speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. To echo Frederick Beekner in his Telling the Truth, um, his Beecher lectures back in 1978, and he was, of course, echoing King Lear, I love the line, speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. We can say anything to God. I love how John Calvin characterizes the Psalms in his preface to the 16th century commentary on the Psalms, written both in French and in Latin. Quote, I have been accustomed to calling the book of Psalms an anatomy of all the parts of the soul. For there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. Rather, the Holy Spirit has here drawn to the life of all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities with which the minds of men are wont to be agitated. I don't normally quote John Calvin. <laughs> I think this is a great quote, but wait a minute, John. Don't forget about the Holy Spirit's penchant for joy, for irrepressible praise. Because, for instance, immediately following that lament, the dash your babies against the rocks lament, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, in my right hand wither, immediately after weeping at the waters of Babylon, what do we get but the very upbeat Psalm 138, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Praise and lament, lament and praise, cheek by jowl, exactly the way, the way they are in life. <clears throat> it's a perfect playlist for the way we are. The Psalter's extraordinary range of emotion is reflected in how the different Gospels report Jesus' last words when, like any other person, at the end of his rope or on his cross, he fell back on scripture to express himself. The evangelists give us this moment, as you know, in different ways, with different psalms. According to Luke, Jesus turns in complete confidence to the one who at his baptism said, this is my son, my beloved. Quoting Psalm 31.5, Jesus says, Into your hands I commit my spirit. And perhaps when we hear those words on Good Friday, we are meant also to think of the verses that precede them. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. 
Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me, incline your ear to me, rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, my faithful God. But, according to both Matthew and Mark, before the moment when Jesus gives up the ghost, he shouts out the opening verse of Psalm 22, words that enable him to give voice to something like despair. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In this case, let me give you the verses that follow immediately upon that opening line. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Apart from the single verses quoted uh, from the cross, Psalms 31 and 22 may not be otherwise familiar to most of us, but the one psalm that just about everybody knows is the 23rd. Like the hymn Amazing Grace, it's found an intimate place in our American culture, quite apart from anybody's religious affiliation or lack thereof. It's a text that belongs to everyone. And for this reason, I suppose, on 9-11, when President Bush addressed the nation for the very first time, the end of that unbearable day, he closed his remarks by reading Psalm 23 in the original King James Version, <laughs> as if, when nothing much else could be said, this scripture would say it all. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It was the first text I ever memorized. In fact, it was um, necessary to get confirmed. <laughs> And boy, am I glad there was that requirement. Because even though I remember nothing other about my confirmation, preparation, or service, <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. Now, with the Protestant Reformation, and along with the rest of the Latin Bible, the Psalter was translated into our vernacular and put into the voices of the laity. The Psalter was the bedrock of worship, 150 songs to sing. To make the singing easier, it became common practice to paraphrase the biblical text not only into the English language, but into the conventions of English poetry. An example of this paraphrase is the version of Psalm 23 that appeared in the 1640 Bay Psalm Book, which was the first printed book in the American colonies. Maggie. It was meant to be sung whether or not it was meant to sound like English is another question. Now, you'll have to listen because I didn't put this on your sheet. The Lord to me a shepherd is, 
Want, therefore, I shall not. <laughs> he in the folds of tender grass doth make me down to lie. Okay, it was 1640, it was a new colony. When <laughs> to waters calm he gently leads, restore my soul doth he. He doth in paths of righteousness for his name's sake lead me. <laughs> Yea, though in valley of death's shade I walk none ill, I'll fear. I walk none ill, I'll fear. Because thou art with me, thy rod and staff my comfort are, fear are. For me a table thou hast spread in presence of my foes. Thou dost anoint my head with oil, my cup, it overflows. <laughs> Goodness and mercy surely shall all my days follow me. And in the Lord's house I shall dwell as long as days shall be. Hmm. Uh, this kind of writing, uh, this version of English, may have served the Puritan colonists, but back in England, leading poets of the day, and there were many, found these renditions to be absolute doggerel. The psalmist David deserved much, much more. And so they did their best. Some, like Sir Philip Sidney and his sister Mary Herbert Sidney, paraphrased all 150 psalms, each in a different verse form. Uh, clearly, they were showing off. Right? <laughs> Others tried their hand at only a few, or in George Herbert's case, uh, only one. And he chose Psalm 23. And here, follow along. The God of love my shepherd is, and he that doth me feed, while he is mine and I am his, what can I want or need? He leads me to the tender grass, where, both, where I both feed and rest, then to the streams that gently pass, in both I have the best. Or if I stray, he doth convert and bring my mind in frame, and all this not for my desert, but for his holy name. Yea, in death's shady black abode, well may I walk, not fear. For thou art with me and thy rod to guide, thy staff to bear. Nay, thou dost make me sit and dine, even in my enemy's sight. My head with oil, my cup with wine, runs over day and night. Surely thy sweet and wondrous love shall measure all my days. And as it never shall remove, so neither shall my praise. Now the King James Version of Psalm 23 famously begins, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Herbert opens with a similar directness, but adds, along with, quatrain stanzas and with a rhyme scheme, his own distinctive poetic touches. Among these are the deceptive, deceptive simplicity of his plain conversational voice. And there's no taking where that voice comes from as you move forward in the psalm. For instance, the Bible's folds of tender grass, those gently flowing streams, you gotta know where they are. They're in England's green and pleasant land. <laughs> He's indigenized the holy land and brought it home. God of love my shepherd is, and he that doth me feed, while he is mine and I am his, what can I want or need? Herbert's strategy from the outset is to take a biblical text that's already rich in the language of I, my, he, his, and then make it still more intimate as if that were possible, and it is. For instance, in lieu of the Lord, he gives us the God of love. And for the God to be my shepherd means that he is mine and I am his. A phrase that, to me at least, suggests the depth of an intimate connection, the intertwined identities of lover and beloved. Moreover, in the psalm's context of eating and drinking, there is a table prepared, a cup that overflows. 
The Anglican Communion Service's Prayer of Humble Access also comes, at least to my mind, with its petition that in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood, quote, we may continually dwell in him and he in us. I think Herbert is picking up that liturgy and bringing it to the table that's prepared in the psalm. In this intercommunion of him and me that brings Herbert's sense of plenitude to a point of overflow, it's not enough to say with King James, I shall not want. Instead, Herbert turns Psalm 23 into a conversation with a close friend whom he asks by way of a rhetorical question, what can I want or need? Given that the Lord is the God of love, the divine host ensures that, as the paraphrase continues, I have the best, that I sit and dine, that my cup with wine runs over day and night. Therefore, the answer to that rhetorical question, what more can I want or need, can only be absolutely nothing. The rest of Herbert's poem follows the lead of the psalm's boast of abundance. Then in closing, it moves to yet another surplus of gratitude. The King James Version of the final verse is, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. By one of my colleagues in Hebrew Bible, I was taught that the follow me all the days of my life really means chase me down. <laughs> Thus, two gifts are received, goodness and mercy on the one hand, and a lifetime in God's house on the other. But Herbert promises to give God something back. That is, in this biblically derived, biblically inspired poem, he gives the God of love his own poetic measure of thanksgiving, his own utmost art of praise. The last lines. Surely thy sweet and wondrous love shall measure all my days, and as it never shall remove, so never shall my praise. The poet's last words of thanks are precisely these words, his version of the psalm. I want to turn now to a poet who showed his debt to the Psalter not by paraphrasing any of the Psalms, but by allowing them to become his muse, the driving force in his work. Jared Manley Hopkins is the poet I'm thinking of. Uh, during his Jesuit novitiate in the mid 19th century in Wales, Hopkins had been very much the poet of praise. Talk about the cup running over. He celebrated a world charged with the grandeur of God in which the pied beauty of dappled things became an occasion to celebrate the Creator's presence in the creation. There are biblical precedents for this, of course. Uh, Psalm 148 does the job of thanksgiving this way. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters, and all great deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command, Mountains and hills, fruit trees, all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things, flying birds. Now, Hopkins places himself in this Genesis-enriched catalog tradition, but with an eye trained on the eccentric and the imperfect, on the bits and pieces of what he calls the freckled world. For instance, glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple colored as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple on ponds trout, tout that, Peter, do that again. I love it so much. <laughs> for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches wings, Landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, 
spare, strange. Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. This mid-century uh, poetic flare-up of joy and gratitude later darkens in the late 1880s in Dublin when Hopkins wrote what he called his terrible sonnets. Whereas the biblical psalmist typically concludes even the most despairing lamentation with some sort of lamentation, excuse me, some sort of affirmation after lamentation, in these poems, Hopkins lingers in the pit. Here's one who, with snot on your sheet. So just listen. <clears throat> I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. What hours, oh, what black hours have we spent this night? What sights you heart saw, ways you went, and more must in yet longer lights delay? With witness I speak this, but where I say hours, I mean years, mean life. And my lament is cries, Countless cries like dead letters sent to dearest him that lives, alas, away. I am gall, heartburn. God's most deep decree bitter would have me taste. My taste was me, bones built in me, flesh-filled, blood-brimmed, the curse. Self east of spirit, a dull, dull sours. I see the lost are like this, and they're scourged to be as I am mine, their sweating selves, but worse. Calling to God out of the depths de profundis, with cries countless, and apparently for naught, Hopkins manages nonetheless to keep talking to the one who stays hidden in the shadows, an out of touch, a wall beloved, who never calls, who never writes, who won't even pick up his mail. Where in the world is dearest him anyway? Yet Hopkins doesn't take this desertion quietly. He becomes openly argumentative in a sonnet that dates from mid-March 1889, one of several written in the spirit of the psalmist when he asks why or how long, placing himself from the outset of this poem within a scriptural frame, Hopkins gives it a Latin epigraph that openly aligns him with the Wobegon Jeremiah, as well as with the psalmist or Job in their lament mode. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when I complain to thee, yet I would plead my case before thee. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? Thou plantest them and they take root, they grow, bring forth fruit. Hmm. Hopkins begins with a Latin rendering of these verses in an epigraph, and then he takes off from there. Thou art indeed just, Lord, if I contend with thee, but, sir, so what I plead is just. Why do sinners' ways prosper? And why must disappointment, all I endeavor, end? Wert thou my enemy, O thou my friend, how wouldst thou worse, I wonder, than thou dost? Defeat, thwart me. O oh, the sots and thralls of lust do in spare hours more thrive than I that spend, sir, life upon thy cause. See, banks and breaks now leave it how thick 
Laced they are again with fretty chervil. Look, and fresh wind shakes them. Birds build, but not I build. No, but strain, time's eunuch, and not breed one work that wakes. Mine, O thou Lord of life, send my roots rain. The sonnet echoes with the complaints of all those Old Testament friends of God, Job, the prophets, along with the psalmist, who find that they have been seduced and abandoned. Are there clergy here? <laughs> Life has been spent Take that word in its fullness. Life has been spent in the Lord's service, but in the end, in the end, what is it amounted to? Why must disappointment all I endeavor end? The contrast with the wicked, however, could not be starker. Sinners' ways prosper. The sots and thralls of lust do in spare hours thrive. You know, when they're not doing real evil, in their spare hours. In the words of Psalm 27, 20, excuse me, 92, 7, the workers of iniquity spring up like grass in the rainy season. They even flourish. Hopkins says in response to their fecundity, not I. You'll note that the speaker pleads his case by contending with God respectfully. He even uses the word sir twice when addressing his Lord. Or is his tongue somewhere in his cheek, sir? <laughs> Still, what all but overwhelms the poem is the speaker's sense not only of being frustrated in his hopes, but of being defeated, thwarted, worsted, and precisely by the one whom he has been trying tirelessly to serve. Sterile, dried up, he looks around him and sees the abundance of the leaved, laced natural world, the banks and breaks, the ditches of even the meanest roadside are vivid with green life. Wind moves like ruach breath through everything. Birds build their nests, await the birth of their young, but not I build, no, but strain, time's eunuch, and not breed one work that wakes. Now the work that Hopkins speaks of here is no doubt his ill-fated teaching career in Dublin. Quote, five wasted years almost have passed in Ireland. He wrote in a journal during what was to be his last spiritual retreat and just a couple of months before he wrote this poem. Quote, I am ashamed of the little I have done, of my waste of time. All my undertakings miscarry. I am like a straining eunuch. And I'm very much aware in the celibate priest of all this sexual language of miscarriage and of the lack of a capacity to make a work that wakes. Together with the conviction of having been thwarted and defeated in his profession, Worn down by illness, he's also realized a dramatic loss of poetic power. Gone is the transfiguring vision that enabled him to see God's grandeur everywhere, in mottled cows, in finches' wings, in rose moles, all in stipple upon trout that swim. By contrast, nothing grows in this spiritual desert. 
And yet, even if Hopkins doesn't close the poem with an abrupt switch to the affirmative, such as we find in Psalm 22's final verses, he nonetheless ends with a supplication to the Lord of life. Send my roots rain. The showers of blessing never actually fall in this psalm of complaint. The desert never blooms. But in the prayerful turn to God in the poem's last line, there is a root of faith, a root struck so deep into bedrock that if not flourish, the poet's withered tree can at least <coughs> hang on, at least weather the drought. Mine, O thou Lord of life, send my roots rain. This is the promise of the parent text of the Psalter Muse, where we are told, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And sometimes it does. Or in the words of Psalm 20, 126, which is my personal fave, which has been given to me in the most unlikely circumstances and precisely when I needed it. The, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then we were like those who weep. It, it ends, those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. There's so much joy in the Psalter, along with lament. And I want to turn in closing to a very joyful poet, born in the mid-1950s, Jewish, born in Philadelphia, went to Harvard, PhD in Princeton, has been teaching for a long time at the University of Utah, who gives me a sense of the sheer joy of taking up the lute, the harp, and the ten-string instrument. Her name is Jacqueline, or Jackie Oshiro. She knows the Psalter in Hebrew, before she ever encountered it in English, as a text to be chanted rather than read, a text known in the tradition of the synagogue as well as in the Yiddish diaspora, and knows the Psalter with a kind of intimacy that in my experience is like nobody else's, even my beloved George Herbert, my beloved Jerry Manley Hopkins. Breezy, conversational, joyful. She confesses to having, quote, a weakness for the wisecrack <laughs> and evidently enjoys giving way to it, even with the Lord. Here I quote from a poem. I'm not sure God cares much for piety. My guess is, since David was his favorite, that he's partial to passion, spontaneity, Likes a little genuine regret. <laughs> Take the first poem in her sequence called Scattered Psalms, which was published in a volume, Dead Men's Praise, a volume from 1999. And would you follow along with me? Handiwork, glory. To the conductor, a song of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament tells his handiwork. Day on day utter speech. Night on night announces knowledge. There is no speech and there are no words without hearing their voice. Psalm 119, 1 to 4. Dare I begin a song of Jacqueline? But what from my heart do I say? Not that it matters, since every line will murmur with the heavens sotto voce, the knowledgeable night, the chatty day, their information constant, simultaneous, the glory of the Lord, and then his handiwork. Indulge them. Theirs is undiluted lyric. And we can't utter speech without its voice. So how hard could it be to write a psalm? 
think of David's fairly modest territory. There are other trees than cedar, willow, and palm, the handiwork of God and his glory. So many kinds of praise he couldn't know. The ferns on their unfinished violins, the jonquils on their giddy, frail trombones, the aspens shaking their silver tambourines, then yellow gold ones, then letting go. What did David know about such changes? The top of the spectrum gone berserk? That when some skyward barricade unhinges, without even a breath, a noise, a spark, the glory of the Lord and then his handiwork, no single earthly thing stays as it was, except insofar as it still sings. Hand me an instrument of ten springs. Everything was put on earth to praise. The crocodile. The cheetah, hallelujah, the nightingale, the lynx, the albatross, the pine tree, fir tree, glacier, hallelujah, the hornet's diligence, the gibbon's voice, the pale reprieve of snow, hallelujah, the volcano's unrestricted exaltation, the forest's lazy ease, the desert's fury, our own extraneous efforts at creation, the handiwork of God, and then his glory. Ashero's poem opens with the initial verses of Psalm 19, where David proclaims that the creation itself declares, speaks, tells the handiwork of God and his glory. This italicized phrase then becomes a refrain in the poem, slightly modulated stanza by stanza, and occupies a different place in each stanza. Dare I begin? <laughs> Starts us with a humble, cheeky question, which the rest of the poem answers in the affirmative. She may dare to speak, even as did David before her. Like him, she too knows that human speech is at best but a descant to the undiluted lyric of the creation, of the heavens, the witness of day and night, of the circuit riding sun, like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. They compose their spectacular lines. They give voice in their own way to God's glory. The heavens are telling. Nonetheless, because we have the ability to declare and tell in words, we also dare to have a part in this orchestration. As Asherow says in another poem, the endless business of creation requires our participation. And so this latter-day Jacqueline dares to sing along with David, pondering exactly how difficult it would be, after all, to write a psalm. Come to think of it, she has resources to draw upon that are far richer than his fairly modest territory. There are so many different kinds of praise he couldn't know. David had the utterance of cedar, willow, and palm, but no idea whatsoever about the botanical hallel implicit in violin ferns, trombone jonquils, or the sustained hallelujah of Utah trees making their transition from summer to fall. The aspens shaking silver tambourines, then yellow gold ones, then letting go. The modesty of David's territory becomes even more apparent when one looks up from the earth unimaginably vaster than the firmament of yore to notice that the heavens have gotten infinitely bigger than Abraham when he looked up or David looked up could imagine. 
the ancient sky. It's no longer the limit. The, yet none of these expansions of the imagination caused the psalmist to lose her voice. Yes, the skyward barricade unhinges, now opening wide David's little world. But we do not open upon a void, a black hole of silence. Rather, precisely because of this explosion of immensity, she's saying, there's now more of God's handiwork and his glory than there used to be. And therefore still more reason to take up a 10 stringed instrument and to praise. Everything was put on earth to praise. Asheru ends her psalm uh, by fulfilling this injunction. She gives us a roll call of creatures, each of which makes its own joyful noise. Some are merely named, right? Um, others sing uh, a more particular tune so that we hear of the hornet's diligence. Isn't that perfect? <laughs> the gibbon's voice. Whole landscapes also join in. There is the pale reprieve of snow. The forest's lazy ease. The volcano's unrestricted exaltation. The desert's fury. God's glory is expressed in the creation's handiwork, firmament and all. But what the psalmist has to offer is also what Ashero presents in this collection of her scattered psalms, a human effort to speak the praises of the heavens now, in our language, our own extraneous efforts at creation, if no one were to make this utterance, day and night would nonetheless keep on singing. And as Jesus said, even the stones would cry out. But for the human psalmist, the human poet, that kind of silence would be horribly lost as an opportunity. A shriveled tongue, a withered right hand. No matter how bleak the prospect, it turns out there's always a song to be sung. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you.